Hi everyone, my name is Maya Juman and I'm a senior at Yale, majoring in ecology and evolutionary biology. I'm a proud member of Sabre College and I've spent the last three and a half years working at the Peabody Museum of Natural History. I've worked in both the vertebrate and invertebrate paleontology collections and I'm here today to give you a little virtual tour of invertebrate paleontology from my home in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I thought I would start with a little overview of the Peabody Museum's collection as a whole. So the entire museum has close to uh, 14 million specimens, and I'll talk a little bit more about the invertebrate paleontology collection specifically in a minute, but I thought I would throw out that larger number just to give you a sense of how vast the entire collection is, um, and also what a great resource it is for students at Yale who want to interact with specimens during lab classes, who want to do research on some of our specimens, or who just want to be involved in the collections like me. And so I would encourage everyone to um, reach out if you're interested in natural history and either work at the Peabody, do research at the Peabody, or just come by and see our collections in person. So why do we care about natural history? Why is natural history important? Many of us loved visiting natural history museums when we were younger, but you may be wondering, why should I care that Yale has a little natural history museum at the top of Science Hill? Why should I bother going and visiting? Well, natural history collections are actually super important for research, and so it's really critical that we maintain our collections, that we properly organize and catalog our collections so that they can be accessed by researchers basically anywhere in the world who are interested in what we have. And so pretty much any time of year, we will have visiting scholars from around the world um, at Yale using our collections for their research. And we'll also, of course, have labs at Yale rely on our collections for what they're working on. And right now we are in the middle of a push to digitize basically the entire museum collection. And so that means we're taking photos of all the specimens that we have and uploading those photos along with all the necessary catalog information, including where they were found, who found them, what species they are, how old they are, etc. so that we can essentially curate a virtual collection and put that online. And so uh, now that we're all stuck at home, if you're interested in looking through our collections virtually, um, I encourage you to go to our webpage and take a look through the Invertebrate Paleontology collections or really any of our collections and um, take a look at our specimens. In Invertebrate Paleontology, we have 4.5 million specimens, which is a really large chunk of the museum's entire collection. At the Peabody Museum pre-renovation, there were actually only about 43 invertebrate paleontology specimens on display. So that just goes to show you that what you see on exhibit is really just the tip of the iceberg and that the collections have so much more to offer. So for the purposes of today's tour, I thought I would focus on my favorite group of invertebrates, and that is cephalopods. So as you can see, I'm a really big fan of cephalopods. Um, cephalopods are a group of mollusks that include octopi, squid, and cuttlefish. And so these soft-bodied cephalopods that I just named are often actually pretty hard to find in the fossil record. And that's because soft tissue rarely preserves as a fossil. So fossils are typically parts uh, that are hard. So for example, the exoskeleton of an ancient crab or the shell of a bivalve. So you typically don't find things like octopi or squid well preserved in the fossil record. In fact, only about 3% of our invertebrate paleontology collection includes uh, soft tissue specimens. So the good news is that not all cephalopods are entirely soft bodied. So there are some living and extinct cephalopods that lived inside uh, shells. And so you may have heard of the chamber nautilus. This is a uh, modern animal that's still alive today. So I have this specimen at home to show you guys. Um, Side note that I don't know why we have this in the house. I think it may have been like a gift from someone a long time ago, but these are actually pretty endangered because they are harvested for their shells since their shells look so cool. So don't be like me, don't own one of these because I don't even know why I have it, so this is bad. Anyway, this is the modern day Nautilus and it did have um, ancient cousins known as ammonoids that looked pretty similar. So. Ammonoids were ancient cephalopods related to the modern day nautilus, octopi, squid, cuttlefish, and like a nautilus, it lived in a chambered shell. So I'm gonna put up a photo of one over here. Um, and these chambers were filled with gas to regulate buoyancy in the water. So this animal was marine. They range in size. So I'm gonna put up a photo of a really, really gigantic one with my foot for scale. Um, we also have one that we're currently working on cleaning and it resides in a um, kiddie pool in our lab for some reason. So here's a photo of that just to give you a sense of scale. 
they could also be really tiny and so my earrings are actually tiny real fossilized aminoids so here's a tiny little aminoid specimen for you um I also seem to have more fossils lying around my home for some reason. So this is another ammonoid fossil. So this is just to give you a sense of scale. They could be this big or they could be really, really, really enormous. So again, here you can see the different chambers. So it's kind of similar to its cousin, the Nautilus right there. If you're wondering why I have all this stuff in my house, that is a great question. Obviously, I am the sort of person who would work at a natural history museum because I have all these random fossils in my home, but none of them are stolen from the Peabody, so none of them are real Peabody specimens, I just want to say. This is not a fossil. I bought this in a thrift shop. Anyway, so yeah, aminoids are really cool. They range in size. They're found all over the place. Um, and one thing that's really neat about them, I think, is that they're often preserved with a little bit of iridescence on the fossil. So I'm gonna put up a picture of that. It's actually really hard to capture on a camera. So um, this is not the best photo out there. This iridescent sheen is caused by a calcium carbonate deposit on the surface of the fossil called nacre. It's kind of like mother of pearl um, and it's a structural color, which it means it's similar to the color in um, bird feathers, for example. It's not caused by a pigment, but it's caused by light playing off the surface of a um, delicate chemical structure. And so that's one thing that I really like about aminoids is they're really pretty and they obviously have a really cool morphology, but they also often preserve with these really neat colors. So one cool thing about aminoids is that you can actually find them um, in North America a lot of the time. So during the Cretaceous period, which was 65 to 150 million years ago, there was a shallow tropical ocean that actually divided North America called the Western Interior Seaway. And so that's why you'll often find marine fossils in the center of the United States. So if any of you are at home in the middle of the country and you want to go out fossil hunting, I would highly recommend it if you know of any deposits around you. So a couple of years ago, I was visiting a friend in Texas and I actually collected some aminoid fossils of my own. So these are not Peabody specimens. I did not steal them from the Peabody, but I thought I would show them to you guys since they are an example of real invertebrate fossils. So this is a fragment from an aminoid. Um, you can see over here, these are the ridges on the outside of the shell. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, I also found another fragment from an aminoid and these were just sort of on an exposed cliff. Um, these are from the Western Interior Seaway. They're probably late Cretaceous. So here's another specimen that I found. It's another aminoid, I think, because you can kind of see these um, striations on the side. And there's also, I think, a hidden second specimen right there. I don't know if you can see that right there. So I think that's part of maybe a bivalve. Um, so yeah. So there's actually also a lot of vertebrate fossils that you can find in the US as well. Um, since I've also worked in vertebrate paleontology, I thought I would just take a quick detour and say that um, you can find a lot of mosasaur fossils, fish fossils, shark fossils, um, also from the Western Interior Seaway. Um, and that's just one deposit, but there's also plenty of other um, time periods that are fossilized in the United States. So I have this shark tooth. Again, I don't know how I acquire these things, but I have this shark tooth that I think is um, more recent than the Cretaceous. Um, but it's from a shark called Otodus. And um, you'll often find these, since shark, sharks would shed teeth, you often find these um, sort of individual teeth so they're not actually that hard to find. Um, I also have this fish fossil. This is from the Green River Formation. Um, the genus is called Nydia. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but this is from the last 50 million years. So again, more recent than the Cretaceous, but I thought I would show you guys a couple of vertebrate fossils as well since I have them on hand. And the moral of the story is that if you want to go fossil hunting in the United States, there is plenty to be found. So definitely check that out. So setting aside aminoids for a second and going back to other kinds of cephalopods, I mentioned that soft-bodied cephalopods like octopi and squid are not easy to preserve in the fossil record because soft tissue preservation is pretty rare. It does happen sometimes. And so I thought I would show you my absolute favorite specimen from the collections. And that is this squid 
from the Jurassic era found in a limestone deposit in Germany. Uh, the limestone deposit is called uh, the Solenhofen deposit and it's actually a lot of important fossils have been found there including I believe one of the specimens of Archaeopteryx which is a super important vertebrate fossil. And so what's really cool about this squid is that the soft tissue, the impression of the body has been preserved and usually you don't see that. You might just see the internal hard part of the squid which is called a pen. Um, and usually the rest of the body is just not visible. But in this case, you can see the outline of the body, um, and you can actually also see this dark blob inside the body, and that is the remnant of the ink sac. The preservation on this fossil is so great that you can also see the ink duct leading down the body from the ink sac. So normally you don't have any organs preserved, and that includes the ink sac, but in this case, you have this remarkable preservation. So I think it's really cool that this ink has been preserved, and preserved ink actually played a super important role in a Yale study about 10 years ago. So a team of Yale researchers led by a student named Jakob Winter um, actually looked under a scanning electron microscope at preserved ink in one of our specimens. So it wasn't this one, but it was another squid that had a preserved ink sac. So these are generally pretty rare. And that inspired them to look into preserved melanin in other fossils, including dinosaur feathers. So some dinosaurs did have feathers and therefore the team figured maybe they could decode the color of those feathers if they looked at the shape and size and arrangement pattern of those melanin packages called melanosomes. And it turns out that um, the shape and size of each of these particles is sort of correlated with a specific color. And so using that system, the team was able to identify that the dinosaur they were working on, Anchiornis, was actually red, white, and black. And so this was the first definitive study on dinosaur color ever published. And I think it's really cool that that discovery was sort of inspired by a uh, fossilized melanin from an invertebrate. And I actually like this story so much that I made an entire podcast episode about uh, fossilized ink and about cephalopod ink in general. So if you're interested, please check it out. I'll put the link in down below. But yeah, I really like that specimen, not just because that's a cool story, but also because I think it's really representative of how our collections can be used for research and can be used to answer all kinds of questions, not just about invertebrates, but about ecosystems in general and climate and vertebrates and, you know, really a ton of different things. Um, the options are endless. And so if you're interested in getting involved with the Peabody, um, please reach out to curators or collection staff because they really welcome student involvement. I can honestly say that working at the Peabody for the last three and a half years was probably one of the best decisions I made as a Yale student. Um, I've met so many great people here, I've done research here, and I've worked here. And so if even if you're just interested in checking out the collections and seeing them in person, um, definitely like talk to the collection staff and reach out. I'm going to put my email here just in case any of you want to reach out and ask any questions about what it's like to work at the Peabody or any questions about our collections in general. Um, but yeah, I highly encourage you all to check out the collections when you're back on campus. Um, and I hope you learned something today about cephalopods. Um, I hope this was interesting. So go out and find some fossils and stay safe, everyone. Thanks.